All right, so we've talked about the cardiovascular system. We've talked about the pulmonary system. Now we're going to go ahead and talk about how the two of those are going to effectively be responding to whenever we're exercising. So we've made references to how we're going to increase our heart rates. We're going to increase our stroke volume. We're really going to do everything we can to increase the amount of blood flow going to those muscles. So we're going to perform at a higher level while we're trying to minimize blood that's going to other areas of the body that aren't really helping us at that point. Now we're going to talk about acute responses. So what's going on right now to regulate and to make sure that you're going to be able to do whatever you're trying to do physically. Then there's chronic adaptations and that's how the body is going to change itself. So it's going to be able to get better at that given endeavor and do so obviously forever afterwards. So in general, we're going to always increase our blood flow to the working muscle. Now, the intensity of the exercise is going to obviously be linked to how much more blood flow. Now, this is happening because a lot of things are going to change with our cardiovascular system. Our heart rate's going to go up, our stroke volume is going to go up, and remember the combination of those two gives us our cardiac output. Blood pressure on the systolic side might go up or will go up. The diastolic blood pressure might stay the same, might go down a little bit, or it might go up depending on position, intensity, and so forth. Blood flow in general is going to obviously increase and the amount of blood you technically have can potentially go down because of you're sweating out that plasma as you're having to thermoregulate, which in turn is going to make your blood more viscous, which makes your heart work a little bit harder, which gets us what's known as cardiac drift. But we're gonna get into that more in a bit. So when it comes to chronic adaptations, okay, your resting heart rate for someone that is relatively untrained is gonna be somewhere between 60 to 80 beats per minute. Now, as you get to be in better and better aerobic condition, this number can drop down into the 40s and potentially even into the 30s. Now, this is gonna be influenced by neural tone, so how much parasympathetic innervation you're getting from your vagus nerve, how much epinephrine you obviously have in the bloodstream, the temperature, so if it's hotter, your uh, heart rate's gonna be elevated because your body is trying to cool you down by giving yourself more blood flow, or if your body's cold, it's going to in turn increase your resting heart rate so that you can sometimes deliver a little bit more blood flow to your tissues. So that way you can shiver effect and keep yourself warm. And at altitude, remember guys, because of the effects of the partial pressure of oxygen, we in turn are gonna to have to have an elevated resting heart rate because we don't have as great of oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. It's really cool is your heart rate's gonna go up before you even start to exercise. And that's because of the one-two punch of a decreased vagal tone while we're increasing the amount of epinephrine and norepinephrine we happen to have in the bloodstream. Now, as we go and do exercise, that heart rate is going to be linearly related to our exercise intensity until eventually we're going to hit our heart rate max. And that's going to be the highest heart rate that we can achieve. Now, when it says highly reproducible, meaning you can do it over and over again, you tend to have a consistent max heart rate. It's going to decline a little bit with age. There's a lot of different formulas that you can use to estimate it. When you do the submax lab for this class, which is gonna be coming up uh, next week at the time of this recording, you're going to go ahead and just use the 220 minus your age to help you estimate what your maximal heart rate is going to be. Now, why we care about this? Because, well, it turns out that's the fastest your heart can beat. And if we know what effectively, or have an idea for what your heart rate max is. We know what level of output you need to be at given intensities as far as heart rates. We can then create this linear relationship, which in turn is going to allow us to estimate what your maximal ability would be. So steady state heart rate is simply going to be the heart rate that your body stays at for a given amount of work that doesn't change. So in the class, we're gonna be doing this pretty much on treadmills, which you can do at the rec. All the information's on there. Each stage, you're walking on it for three minutes, and then you go into the next stage. But we take your essentially average heart rate for each of those stages. And so we take the heart rate right from the 145 to two minute mark and the 245 to three minute mark, do the math, multiply by four to figure out what your true uh, beats per minute is. And then we create effectively this type of graphical information with effectively what the heart rate was, only in this example, we're gonna be looking at instead our oxygen uptake and then use those two points and the slope to extrapolate if we know what the heart rate max is, where we think you'd effectively max out at. Now, this is useful because it's a good way to get an idea of someone's heart rate 
max, well, not sorry, not their heart rate max, but their VO2 max without having to get them to their heart rate max. And so who do you guys think would be good candidates for a sub-max aerobic test as opposed to a full max out aerobic test? Absolutely, guys. All of those are great examples of people that you shouldn't be trying to do a maximal aerobic test on. Now, yeah, let's do it on our actual cross-country athletes. Let's do this on our rowers. Let's do this on our aerobic athletes because they're probably already doing this as part of their training. Obviously not in the exact same controlled settings, but they're going to be doing this a lot frequently. But you don't want to do this with anybody that's not used to it, maybe has some injuries, they're older, something that like anything else, we're increasing the injury risk, but we're not really gaining much of an advantage by having them go through and do this type of stressful work. So we then have how our stroke volume is going to increase. And stroke volume typically maxes out around 40 to 60% of our VO2 max. It can actually max out a little bit higher at a higher percentage of our actual heart rate max and and VO2 max, but that's pretty rare. And that's really, really well-trained individuals. So we're going to find this biggest response in our stroke volume from being at rest to being at essentially moderate exercise. And then the rest of the way, it's pretty much optimized. In fact, it goes down a little bit when you get to maximum heart rate, because literally the heart doesn't have as much time to fill with blood each beat. And so what we typically find is your stroke volume at max is usually half of what it is at rest. So what we're going to find also is that your stroke volume and max exercise is not much different than your uh, stroke volume when you happen to be laying down. That's because you have much better venous return to the heart when you're laying down as opposed to you're standing because in a vertical position, you've got to overcome gravity. When you're laying down, you don't have near as much gravity to push up against. So. Any questions about how stroke volume is gonna go and peak out? So that's part of the reason why with the submax test, we've got to get your exercise intensity to at least 50% of your VO2 max, if not higher, because up until then, your increase in cardiac output is coming from both stroke volume and heart rate. Once we get over that 50% mark, now effectively nearly all the increases in output, as far as cardiac, cardiac output is coming from changes in heart rate, not from changes in stroke volume. Now, there's a number of things that are going to affect our stroke volume. So think of it as before the heart, at the heart, and after the heart, okay? Preload is the before the heart. And this is where we're gonna do a better job of loading that heart with blood coming from the body, thanks to that muscular pump, thanks to that breathing pump to really fill those ventricles maximally. Then the heart itself, while it's pumping, Thanks to our sympathetic nervous system hormones, we're increasing our contractility, which in turn is going to cause us to pump more blood out of the heart per beat, hence the increased ejection fraction. And this is going to be the lower end diastolic volume. Either way, we pump more blood. Then finally, we have our afterload, and this is going to be the resistance at the aorta, which is we're going to typically find it to start to come down. And because of this, we're going to actually be able to obviously increase our stroke volume. So what we have here, guys, is someone going from rest to maximal exercise. We're going to see how it's the volume of blood over here. So the end diastolic volume, so the filling and the end systolic when it's pumping it out. And the same to be said from being in a laying down position or in a standing up position. Now, what we're gonna see is we're gonna get a better amount of that preload when we happen to be at lower intensities, which is increasing that stroke volume, okay? Now, as the heart rate goes up and up, we actually don't have as much time to fill the heart, which in turn, we're going to have a little bit lower stroke volume and due to the lower end diastolic volume. Now, the contractility is gonna keep going up and up and up simply because we're gonna be dumping more and more epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream as we go higher and higher intensity. And the afterload 
thanks to the vasodilation, is going to allow for the lower pressure to overcome, so we're going to get a better stroke volume. So if we're looking at cardiac output, we're going to see that notice the well-trained have a higher cardiac output than the untrained. Makes perfect sense. Notice the heart rate max they're going to hit is actually a bit lower when you're very elite level, simply because your heart's a bit bigger. It just can only open and close at a certain rate. But now, take a look here, guys, at the stroke volume and the heart rate. Notice the untrained individual, their stroke volume actually goes down as their exercise intensity is at the max. Meanwhile, the trained individuals is going to stay about the same. Notice kind of goes down a little bit, goes up, so it's really not much oscillation. But then you have your elites where that stroke volume is going to keep going up and up as we're getting to maximal work outputs. Now, in general, remember guys, cardiac output is simply the combination of our heart rate, beats per minute, multiplied by our stroke volume, which happens to be the volume of blood per beat. So we're going to see as we keep going up in exercise density, cardiac output is going to go up. Makes absolute sense. And then it's going to plateau when we get to our VO2 max, because it turns out we're not able to pump any more blood around our body. Now at rest, we're typically pumping about five liters of blood around our body per minute. As we're going from being untrained to trained, we can go from about 20, 25 liters, depending on your own genetic components for this. But as we get into high levels of training, now we're talking up to potentially 40 liters of blood around the body per minute. Now notice this is just general total amount of blood being pumped around the body. It is not in reference to the size of the bodies. So if you happen to be a bigger person in the first place, you can have a pretty good cardiac output, but if you're very large, you've got so much tissue that you need to now supply with oxygen, you're not actually gonna have that high of VO2 max. So the total max cardiac output is gonna be, notice a combination of both the size of your body and your aerobic fitness. Now, when we wanna figure out our actual VO2, so how much oxygen we're actually able to get in and use, we're going to be looking at what's known as the Fick equation. So what we're going to have is we've got our cardiac output multiplied by that AVO2 difference. So we take our heart rate, multiply by our stroke volume, multiplied by the amount of oxygen we're extracting as we go from the arteries to the veins, we're going to get the total amount of oxygen that happens to be being consumed. So you can see as you go from laying down, sitting, standing, walk, jog, run, you see how that heart rate just keeps going up and up. Now notice the strange relationship where as we're laying to sitting to standing to walking to jogging to running, how stroke volume is gonna go down and then back up. So blood pressure itself on the systolic side is going to go up as we happen to be exercising, which in turn, our mean arterial pressure is probably gonna go up even though the systolic is only one third of that. Diastolic is gonna be slightly lower or slightly higher. It really doesn't fluctuate too much. And the mean arterial pressure is going to be equal to that cardiac output multiplied by our total peripheral resistance. So our total peripheral resistance hopefully is going to go down because we get that vasodilation. However, our cardiac output is going up, hence why we're going to see an overall slight increase in the mean arterial pressure. Now, in general, remember guys, our blood pressure is just the amount of pressure inside of our vessels, of our arteries, as we're going from that high to low, getting it through the body. So the rate pressure product is simply gonna be equal to our heart rate multiplied by that stroke, or by that syst systolic blood pressure. Obviously, this is giving us an idea of how much blood flow we're getting to go around the body, how hard we happen to be contracting with, and doing things like resistance exercise, especially with a Valsalva maneuver, we can massively, massively uptick that blood pressure, which is not a dangerous thing if you're a healthy individual with healthy vasculature. It is an issue if we're dealing with someone that's not healthy and happens to have some issues with their uh, blood pressure or they are cr incredibly sedentary, kind of going back to the whole maxing people out with aerobic fitness tests, it's not necessary unless you happen to be dealing with somebody of the caliber and the training that it's actually useful for. If you're dealing with someone sedentary, your risk reward ratio is incredibly inverted. What's fascinating is your blood pressure tends to actually respond higher when you're doing training with the upper body as opposed to with the lower body. But at the same time, notice diastolic doesn't really move up too much, whereas systolic is going to be the one that is moving up much higher thanks to the contractility of the heart. Now, knowing 
that we've increased the cardiac output is not enough. We need to do a better job of sending blood flow to those muscles that are actually exercising and effectively not sending blood to the different parts of the body that aren't necessary when we happen to be exercising at a high level, which effectively means our entire GI system, which involves the accessory organs for digestion, the liver and the pancreas, and also our kidneys. So the, this slide is really important because it's gonna show that we're going to have changes in percentage and absolute blood flow to areas. Now, local vasodilation is going to always override global vasoconstriction, meaning thanks to doing hard exercise, you are going to be dropping a lot of epinephrine into the bloodstream. This epinephrine in turn is going to cause vasoconstriction to everywhere in the body. However, the local signals for vasodilation that are gonna come from metabolic factors, endothelial factors that we've talked about before are going to override that vasoconstriction and hence we're going to have greater vasodilation to those areas, specifically the muscles that happen to be exercising. Now, as we get to be warmer and warmer, we're going to do a better job of also dilating the vasculature going to our skin. Now, this becomes an issue as we get up to maximal exercise in that you can see how we're gonna go from having the percentages increase and then peak here at light decrease and then decrease the most of maximal exercise. Meanwhile, we see how we're consistently getting less blood flow to our accessory organs. We're getting more blood flow to our muscle. We're keeping the same percentage to the heart, which gives a greater volume over time and a lower percentage to the brain, but notice how the brain is getting the same amount of blood flow. Now, why do you think it would can be a potential issue that your blood flow to your skin is actually going to go down as you're getting up into maximal exercise. Why do you guys think that could be potentially an issue? Exactly, guys, overheating. And hence, this is going to be a liability if you have people working out in very hot conditions. But then think about having a mixed group of athletes. So you're running some type of sporting camp over the summer. You've got kids that are in shape. You got kids that are in between the kids that are out of shape. Of the kids there, if you're going to have them all run, run a lap for a warm up and a cool down, who are gonna be the kids there that are most likely to have the issues with overheating? Or heat illness as we should probably refer to it. Bingo, because you happen to be having to run and it's probably that running is instead of, if you're in good shape, that running a lap to warm up is light, maybe moderate. But if you're out of shape, that could be true maximal efforts and boom, congratulations. You've got some potential issues with overheating. Now, a not a negative effect like the straight up heat illness you might get, but another thing that's gonna occur when you exercise for long periods of time at a given work output, you're gonna to start to go through what's known as cardiovascular drift. So because we're sweating, because we're sending Obviously, some of that fluid out of our sweat glands, we're losing plasma volume, increasing our hematocrit, which in turn is making it harder for the heart to pump that blood around the body. Our stroke volume is going to go down slightly. And since our stroke volume is going to go down, in turn, the only way that we can keep up the same amount of cardiac output is to increase our actual heart rate. So this is why if you're exercising for long periods of time at the same intensity, it's going to actually start to feel a little bit more difficult. You might notice your heart rate is drifting up, and this is simply due to cardiovascular drift because stroke volume over a long enough period of time if we're exercising, and obviously we're talking about some things with hydration otherwise going on, then we're going to go ahead and get ourselves into a situation where now we happen to have a effectively higher heart rate so we can maintain that same cardiac output. Also the worst film in the Fast and the Furious franchise. So our body is always trying to send the minimal amount of blood flow to whatever tissues it can. 
Now, at a certain point, it doesn't have enough extra to send it to different areas. And this is especially going to be a factor when we're exercising. So we're going to have issues with obviously digestion. And sure, some of you guys have cramped up because you had a big meal. And then you try to work out and uh, you were regretty because you ate too much spaghetti. And that's because it turns out what's more important to your body is always going to be sending that blood flow to your muscles. Your body doesn't understand why you're running or why your heart rate is up. It simply knows it's up and we need to send it to the muscles because it's more important to run away from the lion and not become the lion's meal than it is important for you to digest the meal that's currently in you. And the same thing with the heat and blood flow to the skin. It's more important that you run away from the animal than it is that you potentially overheat and don't make it away from the animal. So your body is going to kind of triage things, set things up in order of what it thinks is important, given the fact that it doesn't have all the information. So instead, it's going to prioritize one side or the other. Now, this can potentially decrease blood flow to the muscle, but typically muscle is going to win and the other tissues that are going to be sacrificed. So as we're going to go ahead and start exercising at higher and higher intensities, like we talked about last time, you are going to do a better job of extracting oxygen from your bloodstream. You're going to have a greater AVO2 difference. And now that we are able to have better vasodilation to those individual capillaries, we're picking up that oxygen much more. In turn, we're going to have a lower amount of oxygen coming from those capillaries, so notice from the active muscle. The key is when it goes to inactive tissue, which still does happen, or it's just nowhere near as active, we're going to have a much higher mixed venous A2. That's why we said it was 100 at the top and then 40 at the bottom, even though some of those capillaries are going to come off as zero, others might be as high as 60, 70. Hence, when you average it out, it's probably going to look more like 40. So another thing that's going to happen is you can have fluid moving into outer compartments than just being in the capillary. And this is through hydrostatic pressure, unconic, and osmotic pressures, where you know fluids are going to shift to make sure that they're maintaining those osmolarities and those essential diffusion gradients. So as we happen to be exercising when we're in an upright position, over time, we're going to decrease our plasma volume simply because we now have these fluids, thanks to forces, pulling out of the body, which is going to increase that mean arterial pressure. And as we increase that pressure, a capillary hydrostatic pressure is going to also increase. And those metabolites that we're producing are going to increase that tissue's osmotic pressure. So hence the lactate you're producing, uh, carbon dioxide, obviously to a lesser extent, nitric oxide is going to be a vasodilator and sweating in turn is going to decrease that volume. Now, thanks to all the sweating, we go through what's known as hemoconcentration, which means we're going to have a lower fluid percent of blood, but a higher red blood cell percentage inside of the blood. Now, this can increase our hematocrit. And now that we've increased our hematocrit, yay, we've got a higher red blood cell concentration, which in, in turn means we've got higher hemoglobin concentration, which in turn means we actually can carry more oxygen per unit of blood. The issue with it is now your blood is becoming more viscous and it's becoming more viscous. It's gonna become more difficult for the body to go ahead and be able to send this around. So that way you're going to go ahead and still have to work harder when it comes to heart rate to maintain the same cardiac output to get the same amount of oxygen to the tissues. So what's regulating all this? Turns out a lot of different stuff, okay? Now, part of this is going to be with rapid control through your actual nervous system. Other parts of this are going to be obviously through hormonal changes. So a higher brain is going to go ahead and not just activate our muscles, but it's going to start activating our wonderful cardiovascular centers, which in turn is going to give us some vasoconstriction everywhere. But the, remember, the local factors will override that, and it's going to increase that heart rate. So we're then going to have those chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors think back to breathing, how we're detecting the amount of oxygen, carbon dioxide we have in the body, pressure sensors, which hopefully should be firing appropriately so we're not passing out. And we showed you the wonderful video of the diesel weasel. So you could see examples of what happens when your pressure goes down really rapidly and your nervous system isn't able to adapt. Uh, and you go night, night. But overall, if you understand this slide, 
you're going to understand how things are going. So it's going to occur pretty quickly and it is a complex response that is going to be appropriate for whatever situation. And the big first priority here is that we maintain blood pressure. Because remember, if that blood pressure goes down rapidly, especially to the brain, you will pass out. If your blood pressure goes rapidly to your brain, you can do potential damage to the vasculature in your head, and that's not a good thing. So the body's gonna do its best to make sure it mitigates those chances. Now, let's go and zoom this bad boy in so you guys can see this a little bit more clearly when we're looking over here. So the medulla is gonna be where we're regulating this. This in turn is going to tell the heart to go ahead and modulate its pressure, mostly through that vagal tone. Now, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves are gonna cause our heart rate to move appropriately. Now, sympathetic, remember we're talking about hormonal action. Now, from there, we're going to have the brain actually telling the body like, okay, we're about to recruit all this musculature, you probably need to increase the cardiac output. So this in turn is gonna send this information on down so that now our arteries are going to in turn make sure they're modulating our pressure appropriately as that heart rate's going up. Now, we're gonna have less blood flow to the GI, to the intestines, to the kidneys, and also to the liver. And from there, we're going to eventually have a lower amount of blood flow to the skin itself, okay? Now, this in turn is gonna have, the, we're gonna have those causes of local, um, sorry, metabolic factors that are gonna override and cause vasodilation to the tissues that we happen to be really using. And so, like anything else, we can only get so much blood to go in that area. And we're going to have at some point where we've matched up to what we need and the heart rate's not gonna go any further than it needs to be. Now, obviously we're going to have a little bit let, or a little bit of a feed forward at the very end where we're going to go ahead and modulate our pressure. And that's like, okay, all of our tissues are oxygenated enough. We can move on and we don't need to go up any higher with our heart rate. We've got enough that we're gonna keep all of our tissues alive and working properly. Now, that was just talking about effectively, mostly the heart, and then a little bit to do with obviously our blood vessels and with our blood itself. Now let's talk about our breathing rate, which is, it turns out it's gonna go up. And this is actually gonna go up before we even start exercising. We're going to have an anticipatory response, meaning we're like, okay, this is coming. Let's start breathing faster. Let's get ready to go. Then once we go ahead and really start exercising, we're gonna have a, another increase in ventilation. And this is gonna be thanks to chemical changes. Specifically, once our CO2 levels and the proton levels get high enough, this is like that talk test where you're now going to not just be breathing faster the entire time, but you're going to hit a point where we have an inflection, which is even higher, where you're going to be breathing to the point in which it's going to be very, very difficult to hold a conversation with somebody that happens to be running or working out with you. So our ventilation is going to always increase appropriately to what we happen to be doing, okay? If we're working out at low exercise intensities, we're not going to breathe a lot. We're working out high exercise intensities, we're going to breathe at high rates. And we're going to sometimes take a little bit of time to recover our breath after an exercise. This is going to be thanks to changes in our pH, the partial pressure under carbon dioxide, and potentially the temperature that we happen to be undergoing. So if you guys look over here, we can see that general amount of breathing, so liters per minute, as we go up and do light, moderate, or heavy exercise, notice when you're doing that light exercise, you stop, you come back down rapidly. Whereas when we're talking about heavy exercise, it's gonna take a much longer period of time. We've got that longer tail coming off to the side and it's always gonna be related to how hard we happen to be exercising. And remember back to when we talk about EPOC, where we're really just effectively trying to clear all the uh, metabolic byproducts, reoxygenate all of our tissues to the best of our ability and get ourselves back to homeostasis to the best that we can. Now, there are some situations where we're gonna have issues with breathing irregularities. Dyspnea, which can be a shortness of breath. Now this can be due to a number of different factors, inabilities to adjust to the exercises that you're doing, and even potentially that the respiratory muscles are not able to keep up to the work output that's being asked of the body. We then have hyperventilation, which is gonna be breathing way more than you need to. And this is going to be due to anticipation, anxiety about the exercise you're gonna have. Now, in turn, this is actually gonna really decrease your 
uh, partial pressure carbon dioxide, which is going to increase your blood pH and then hopefully decreases your drive to breathe. Otherwise, if that doesn't happen, you can sometimes have some issues with uh, blacking out. And if you guys are interested, looking into some of the more recent, this is more pop culture things, of like Wim Hof and other types of ways to modulate breathing as ways to get into you know, sympathetic and parasympathetic states and kind of exploring that and how your body responds could be something fun or interesting that you guys could try on your own. Be smart about it. A lot of people have made some poor decisions if you look into that. Um, yeah, if you're interested in how to spell Wim Hof, I'll go through it with you guys, but otherwise. Now, the valve maneuver is a completely normal and safe thing to do when you're exercising and you're in shape. Now, this is specifically when you're doing resistance training. We're increasing our intra-abdominal pressure by bearing down. We're closing our glottis, so we're not going to get air to release. And because of this, we're going to be increasing our thoracic pressure, which is great because it's going to keep us safe when we happen to be lifting really, really heavy weights. However, this is going to collapse great the veins returning. And because of that, our cardiac output is going to go down and our arterial blood pressure is going to go down. You can literally go high enough blood pressure here that you can actually slightly stop or really mitigate the blood flow to the rest of your body for a little bit. Uh, this is something that happens more in like super strong and potentially crazy uh, power lifters, strong men, other folks that are doing way more weight than seems like it would be a rational and good decision to do. But remember, it's a completely normal thing that is going to occur when you happen to be doing heavy resistance training in healthy people. If you're teaching gam gams and grandpa how to wait or how to lift weights, that's a bad choice. Make sure they can breathe the entire time. <clears throat> Make sure they're learning how to breathe to the appropriate cadence. If <clears throat> one of you guys are maxing out and you're about to try to pick up a really heavy deadlift or uh, you're trying to squat a really heavy load, yes, you should do the Valsalva. And if you let that air out a little too early, that's a good way to turn yourself into a uh, accordion or effectively be uh, bent over and potentially hurting your spine. So there are reasons to use it, but be aware of the fact that obviously it comes with some caveats of who and who is not an appropriate individual to try something like this. Now, as you suspect, for the most part, the rate at which we're breathing is gonna be matching how much energy we're using. And so what we're going to find is ventilatory equivalence. This is really just how much oxygen we're breathing in to how much oxygen we're consuming per minute. Now, we're going to see as an individual increases their exercise intensity, at a certain point, the breathing rate is going to far outpace the increase that it was previously. And that's usually the part where it's really hard to hold the conversation. This was known as the ventilatory threshold. This is the point at which we're now starting to get lactate accumulation, which comes with that wonderful proton, which is dropping our pH. And so our body is doing the best it can to try to buffer things out to remember bicarbonate is the major way that we're going to be carrying carbon dioxide out of the body. So this is a normal factor and it's a really good indices of someone's aerobic component that they can maintain for an incredibly long period of time. Because your VO2 max, you can't really hold on to that for too long because you're already having to use anaerobic metabolism to keep up that performance. Whereas once we're at or below the ventilatory threshold, we're still aerobic on average glycolysis. So we're not really accumulating enough lactate and or any other byproducts. So yes, we'll have an issue where eventually we just run out of glycogen and we're not able to keep up those work outputs, but we are able to make sure that we're producing enough energy aerobically that we're not gonna have to stop thanks to byproduct accumulation. So when you're working with people, this is really useful to effectively, especially if you're working with someone that's very large and they're trying to get in shape, just go for a walk with them and figure out and slowly increase the pace you guys are walking until they're not able to keep up their side of the conversation. And there's your point that they're effectively having to use more of the anaerobic energy systems to keep up that work output. And it gives you a good idea of where their aerobic base is at. Now, the ventilatory threshold is not the same as your actual lactate threshold, but they're pretty close to each other. So what we're gonna find is, remember, as we happen to be getting more lactate and more carbon dioxide, we're going to have to, at some point, really uptick our breathing rate. So that way we're gonna be able to buffer this out. So a better way to do this is not just to look at that point of inflection with oxygen, 
but you can actually literally measure the blood lactate levels and find that point of inflection where it starts to go up, okay? Now, there's a number of things that obviously are gonna be limitations here. Rarely is your ventilation not gonna be a limiting factor. I think we all understand the joys of wearing one of these definitely make things a little bit more interesting than it happens to be without. And actually for your guys' labs, you guys are supposed to be wearing a, obviously mask when you're exercising at the rec. So for extra credit, and this is for the folks listening here and they obviously listen to it again, you're gonna do your submax VO2 lab twice, once with your mask on and the second time with a heavier mask, if that makes any sense. So this is a thinner, obviously, uh, more medical one. I've got cloth ones, wear a cloth one, see how that influences your number. Preferably don't do that on the same day. Rarely are you gonna find folks where their limiting factor is actually how much they can breathe because the respiratory muscles are pretty good about not fatiguing out. Now this can occur if you're like in an insanely high level aerobic athlete, but for the most part, we don't really need to worry about it. We obviously need to spend more blood flow literally to the diaphragm and the other muscles involved with inspiration and expiration. So we're going to be able to turn over the air fast enough and our air resistance is not really gonna be an issue when we're at sea level, can potentially, it's more of a gas diffusion issue when you get up to high elevations, but we don't really breathe air enough that's got a high enough resistance to breathing that's gonna give us an issue. Now, obviously there's individuals that have got different types of disorders that can cause it to be limiting factors. Obviously, I'm sure everyone's met someone here that has asthma or otherwise it's gonna be having a negative effect on the performance. And, or you could wear something like one of those elevation masks or otherwise that obviously is gonna increase the resistance to breathing. So those insanely, insanely high level athletes might actually be able to go to a point at which they're literally not able to breathe fast enough for the amount of oxygen in their heart and well, their heart can effectively pump around their body and it can be uptake or uptooken, uptaken? It's uptook, jeez, English. Um, into those muscles of interest. So this is where we're going to have kind of that mismatch. And this is going to be what's known as exercise induced arterial hypoxemia. So literally we don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity there. Now, another big component when it comes to our breathing, remember is going to deal with balancing our acid base levels. Now we want to stay within relatively tight confines for not just your blood, but also your muscle. Now, as it gets to be lower, that's where you're gonna vomit because you're concerned about hurting yourself. And same thing when it gets low enough, remember the enzymes related to glycolysis and the muscle won't work anymore. So the more we breathe, the better of a job we're going to do, specifically when we hit beyond that ventilatory threshold, where we're going to in turn be able to get more bicarbonate effectively being created inside of the blood which in turn is going to allow us to exercise at that high level for a little bit longer. Also, we're gonna be binding and removing some of it thanks to our renal filtration. So what we have here, guys, is effectively what each of these makes up as far as percentages inside of the blood uh, of its capacity. And then the slight score is gonna be effectively how much hydrogen ions are able to be taken up per liter of blood. And you'll go ahead, and if you can see here, and I apologize, it's much smaller. Let's go and zoom that in a little bit. Where, in turn, you're going to go ahead, and as we go further and further, notice this is a 400 meter, which is just straight up welcome to the pain, you're going to see the lactate levels shooting up. The pH levels in the muscles are going to go down a little bit, but you're definitely going to see more coming so from the muscle itself. Ugh. And notice, guys, this is after they've actually performed the run, five, min five minutes, where they're still in those acidic environments. So that's why we care about things like active recoveries, because an active recovery, as we're moving around, remember, lactate is a fuel source, and that proton is going to come with it into that type 1 muscle fiber that's going to utilize it as a fuel source. So by doing active recovery, in turn, you're going to get that pH to come up a lot faster as opposed to if you just sit and take the pain for a while. So there are certain tactical decisions that would lead you to do one or the other, but it's not so much that one is the better decision to make. Now, remember those wonderful 
chemical buffers are gonna be doing a good job making sure the pH doesn't go too low. Our ventilation is gonna help as is gonna be our kidneys. Now, this is gonna be the graphical example of looking at how that blood lactate is gonna decline far more rapidly when we happen to be doing a aerobic or just a, an active recovery. This could be going for a walk, light swim, something where we're still moving as opposed to a completely passive, just sitting there, not moving the body because we have, aside from our brain, our heart, and then our liver, we don't really have a lot of other tissues that are trying to use up that extra lactate. And as you suspect, greater amounts of air pollution is gonna have a negative effect on your body's ability to perform aerobically. Carbon monoxide obviously can be quite lethal. Hence, you need to be careful about having a furnace that works correctly, along with making sure you have alarms for it because it binds much, much harder to hemoglobin. And unfortunately, once that happens, your oxygen carrying capacity naturally is gonna go down. Now, ozone is gonna be something that's gonna occur typically from uh, electrical charges and otherwise. This is something that's definitely not something you want to breathe in, as is sulfur oxide and a number of other wonderful types of pollutants that you're going to get from running along highways, main roads, or being near factories otherwise, unfortunately producing these through wonderful byproduct production. So, yeehaw, we just covered a, another solid a lot of everything and I talk too much. So, Let's try to have ourselves, hmm. yeah, let's go ahead and I want you guys to think through, okay? If our goal was to put you in a position to where you're going to go ahead and be able to have the best aerobic performance, okay, for having you running outside in and around Richmond, what would probably be the best location for you to go ahead and do said running if we're trying to go and mitigate any potential exposure to any types of air pollution? Where would we want you to go? Potentially, yes. But don't so much think of a park. Where would you want to be geographically? Yeah, could be out in the woods somewhere. Absolutely. Abs and great job there, Evan. Far away from traffic, far away from a lot of car exhaust, far away from any types of industrial pollutants or otherwise that might be being put into the air. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not the equivalent of trying to work out in like a major city, but how many of you guys have actually seen fog? Or sorry, fog. Hopefully you've all seen fog at least once in your life. How many of you guys have seen smog? I guess you've seen smog before from a big city. Smog is going to be that wonderful kind of haze that you're going to be able to see whenever you happen to be around large cities like LA is pretty bad for it. Um, and some of the other like larger cities. Mm-hmm. And that's just due to all of the different vehicles using internal combustion engines, along with obviously all of the different types of fuels that are being burned, essentially, that is now being put into the atmosphere around it. And in fact, I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar, but it was in, obviously a number of years ago for the Beijing Olympics, there was a number of marathoners that were actually talking about not competing at the Beijing Olympics because of how bad the air quality typically is in Beijing, thanks to all of the motor vehicles and otherwise in those areas. So it is a definitely a potential issue um, to be aware of. And I'm sure also, and we're changing gears here very rapidly, I'm sure all of you guys have intuitively felt that ventilatory threshold we talked about earlier, where as we're exercising up and up in a higher intensity, you have that point where like, you got to focus on breathing. You're not really trying to have a conversation with the person next to you. So do you guys have any questions about any of the things that we've covered so far? 
any of the information that you guys would like me to elaborate on because we're still moving obviously pretty quick through the information on Friday. Remember, we're gonna be outside. Do come in, make sure you do the vertical jump testing. Make sure you guys are gonna be doing the wonderful um, reps to failure and make sure that you guys are going to be at some point um, coming in and trying to do the body comp with a skin full of calipers. If you need to borrow them and take them home uh, and obviously find a partner, that's more than fine. Right now, if you guys need to find a partner to do the body comp lab, this is the time to put that up in the chat. You guys can hopefully and arrange for a time that it's gonna work for everyone or for you and your partner. And we'll be able to make sure you guys get that testing done. You'll be here, you can do the vertical jumping as well. Make sure you guys familiarize yourself with the body comp lab and the locations that need to be calipered and doing so appropriately. If I'm in the lab or Ehor's in the lab, we'll be more than happy to go through it with you. Make sure that you're calipering the locations appropriately, but we will also, you know, try not to be over you guys so that you guys are allowed to learn, to practice and figure this out as we're going. So questions, comments, concerns, and or whenever you guys are ready, go ahead. Oh, your stroke volume goes down a little bit when you go from laying down to sitting up to standing up. And the reasoning for it is now we have to overcome more and more effects of gravity. And then when we go from just standing up to walking, to jogging, to running, it's gonna be only going upwards. So it kind of goes down a little bit and then really starts to shoot up. And that's, that was the reasoning for that. Anytime. Good stuff.